if I'm looking for help from God, it's probably wise to do things the way that he likes it, whether I understand it or not, whether I like it or not. You know, we as Americans can scream and yell and ch clap for men in tights chasing pigskin, just saying, or hitting a little ball and running around in trying to get back home. <laughs> but we can't worship God the way he wants. Come on, they paint their faces and run around in their underwear and all kinds of things for sports, but we can't worship God the way he wants to be worshipped. So if there's songs that are singing, lift your hands, there's probably a reason. <laughs> Amen? If you, this is body language. You guys know what this means? It means you're not open. So you're telling God, you're, you're here to be changed, you're here to be with him, but you're telling him, I'm going to do it my way, I'm not going to let you in. And so you're going to keep on going and go around some mountains for a while until we decide to do it God's way. Amen? I tried it the other way, it didn't work too good. You know, there's people that are here for a reason, and if they don't really get the, the surrender part. Okay, so if you're not lifting your hands, if you're not doing the way God wants you to, not just because the song says so. Sometimes it says raise your hands and I'm on the ground because I can be kneeling when I'm standing. I can have my arms up when they're down. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just about what you're doing. It's about a hard attitude. But if you got your arms folded, God... God's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He is not going to invade your space that you don't want him to invade. He, he just won't do it. And the things that we have our hands on, God folds his arms and he says, okay, let me know when you're done. Let me know when you want me to intervene. Amen? So just a little note from Mama Kate on worship. Praise God. So I'm going to explain to you how we got in this mess in the first place. So um, do you guys all know America's kind of messed up? Have you figured that out? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about church versus politics. So it's supposed to be, according to the world, church versus politics instead of church in politics. That's why America is the mess that it is. We've allowed it to be a mess. God told us believers to take dominion to be involved, to take authority. He told us to take the land. He told us to clean out what needed to be cleaned out, right? And meanwhile, separation of church and state, we've taken our hands off the nation and just hid in our little churches, having church as usual. And meanwhile, the country's going to hell in a handbasket, literally. So it's time to get busy. So I'm going to tell you what I think the Lord was telling me. Part of our problem is that America, by definition, is a free republic. So a, re a free republic is a state in which supreme power is held by the people. Okay? And in America, uh, we are operated under a supreme law, which is called the Constitution. Are you guys, anybody else seeing the Constitution being like trampled underfoot, thrown in the garbage, ripped up by all these crazy governors that think they can tell us what they can do, keep us in our house for indefinite periods of time? We're in trouble. America's in trouble. America needs the church to rise up in power, take dominion, and get back to where God told us to be. All the way back in the garden. Take dominion. Amen? Amen. So the problem is, America is supposed to be one nation under God. Not just one nation of a whole bunch of people with supreme power to do whatever they think they want to do, right? So there's a little problem with that freedom, because if we're not under God, then it's not going to work. And that's where it's all gone wrong, amen? We, we've allowed these people to be voted in. We haven't done anything about it. How many people have you talked about? Are you registered to vote? Do you know what's going on? We're not to just keep our mouths shut. Amen? Now, I believe 100% that Donald Trump will be reelected because it's been prophesied. However, prophecies are subject to us. 
okay? We still got to do the work. We still got to go vote. Anybody in this room that's not registered to vote, it is your responsibility to vote. Get registered. Amen? Take dominion. Just saying. If you need help, we'll get you help. So here we are as Americans wanting to do whatever we want. We have a free will, which God gave us. But our free will was supposed to be under God. Amen? Um, so God's kingdom is a whole lot different than America. And that's where we as Americans have a problem. You know, we're raised um, to kind of do whatever we want. I, I remember my kid turning 18. It's like, oh boy, now I don't have to listen to you. But we still go out as adults and you don't have to listen to anybody, but you're not listening to God. Amen? So the kingdom of God, however, is an absolute monarchy. So it's no wonder that even people like in communist countries that are told what to do by a, a supreme ruler, that revival and miracle signs and wonders are happening there more than they're happening here. Because they understand how to bow to authority. Amen? So if they understand that in the natural, they understand how to bow to authority with God. We have to learn how to bow to authority, and we have to learn how to not take our freedoms for granted. Amen? One nation under God. So a true subject in a kingdom, which God's is a kingdom, look back when um, the people of Israel, they wanted a king. They had God to tell them what to do through their leaders, but they wanted a king. They wanted a king. Okay, have it your way. And God's going to tell us that all the time. You be careful what you ask for. God's going to give you what you ask for. Have it your way. Have a king. So we don't have a king, but how did that work for him, them? Right? Because then it depends on if you have a good king or a bad king. So is God a good king? Can we trust him? Can we trust him that what he says to do is probably a good idea? Can we trust him that when he says that you were created to worship him, you were created to worship him. So if you do worship him the way he is prescribing to be worshipped, you go to the doctor, they tell you something to do, you do it, right? You trust the doctor. How about trusting God with what he's prescribing? Amen? So we can trust the good king that if we do what he wants us to do, that probably good things will happen. Amen? So, as true subjects in the kingdom, which we call ourselves Christians, so that's what we are, we're supposed to treat the king with devotion and unwavering respect. The king's wishes are not questions, but obeyed. But as Americans, we don't really kind of understand that, right? So as an adult Christian with a thinking mind, I'm going to try to push back what I've grown to believe and what I've grown to think and think according to the Word of God. And if you're not in the Word, you can't think according to the Word, right? The Bible says, cast down all thoughts and imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of Christ. But if you don't have the knowledge of Christ, you can't cast down the thoughts and imaginations. Amen? So in the kingdom, in the monarchy, obedience is considered a privilege. It's a privilege to lift your hands and worship God. It's a privilege to surrender and die to yourself. You know what? If you can't do that, either you, you're uneducated, what God says, which is why I'm teaching you, or you don't care, in which case, please stay home. Seriously. I'll tell you why in a second. I'll tell you why in a second. If you don't care about worshiping God, just don't come. Um, and I forgot the third reason. Uh, oh, because, you, you know, if you don't have control over this, somebody else does. I'm free to worship. I'm free to lift my hands. I'm free to exalt God. So, you know, it's a process. But if, if you are bound up, but you can look around a room and see people with freedom all over their faces and joy in their hearts, you might want to do what they do to get what they have. Whether you understand it or not, I'm just saying, you want the process to go fast or slow. That's why you got me and Pastor 
to, we've already been through all of this. We've already learned all this. So here we are to help you to learn quicker. Amen? So when I was caused to do a Bible study today, <laughs> then I asked myself, what, is, what do I need to learn? What, what? So I'm here preaching to myself, guys, okay? Because um, I'm always wanting to know what I need to learn. How can I change? One of the major principles in Christianity is to stop looking at everybody else and ask God how I can change. How can you change? What is God trying to teach you about you? And I tell people when, when Guy and I got remarried and together and he was all holy and sanctified all of a sudden and I'm still this one day at a time kind of Christian, I would be trying to argue with him about this kind of stuff or express my feelings because I had a need to be understood. And he would say, that's a demon, by the way, the need to be understood. <laughs> Just saying. So I would... He said, go pray. I don't want to go pray. I want to talk about it. He wouldn't talk about it. So I would go to pray, and I would give my complaints to the Lord. And that's legal. If you got a complaint, go complain to the Lord. And you'll probably get what I got. You know what I got? I got a great big cosmic mirror that came down from heaven and got so close to my face that I couldn't see anything else but myself. I couldn't see around it. And very early on, I learned to really embrace and enjoy that mirror, no matter how painful it was. Amen? So that's why we're here, right? We're not here just for another word. We're here to learn. We're here to grow. We're here to be empowered. We're here to apply the word as God prescribes to our own life. Amen? So obedience is considered a privilege in the kingdom and... If you don't trust this, then do you trust the king? Or do you believe that the word comes from God? That's a whole other subject in itself. So we're raised to be self-willed in America and make our own decisions and have things our way, or at least maybe we'd be willing to compromise. So we're going to talk about compromise today. And I consider calling this teaching the spirit of compromise, but we're going to call it compromise to promise. We're going to go from compromise to promise, amen? What's a compromise? It's like a mutual concession. I'll give a little bit, you give a little bit, right? And, but the, the word compromise in kingdom standards means dishonorable or shameful concession. So to not do things the way God wants and want God to compromise with the way we want, that's a shameful concession. It's not a good kind of a compromise. Amen? Everybody understand what I'm saying? So... You know, when you use the word compromise, if we don't eat right or we don't get enough rest, we're compromising our health, right? If we don't treat people kindly, we're compromising our relationships. So the spirit of compromise is definitely in the church in America. Amen? Man, the church is a mess. I don't even like church, you guys. I go to other churches, I was like, oh, that was nice. Okay, let's go home. The truth is here, the worship's here, and I'm, I almost forgot to tell you why I said, if you don't care about worship, please don't come. And I'm not kidding. And I speak for my husband, too. Because Think about the Pentecost. God said, wait here until you be empowered. Wait here. And then... Some left, some stayed. It took 10 whole days for them to be in one accord. 10 whole days for the Lord to show up. Can you imagine if everybody came in this place and worshiped God the way he prescribed and got their eyes off themselves? Oh, my. We wouldn't even need the word. We could all just go home. I I'm telling you, the God said in the end times that it's going to be like the book of Acts, and he said that, Greater signs will happen through us. Well, 
we're not there yet, right? How are we going to get there? We're going to have to let go of compromise, do what the Lord prescribes, and be empowered. I'm looking to raise the dead. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Miracle signs and wonders shall follow. Where are they? They're all buried under compromise. Amen? So let's go to Ephesians. We are going to go in the Word. Ephesians 5.27. So pastor was feeling a little under the weather. Oh, let's say a lot under the weather. I don't know if you guys know. By nature, pastor doesn't want to sleep because he might miss something. And if his body gives him a signal like pain or fatigue, he tells it to shut up. And he keeps going. So Brittany said something very brilliant the other day. He, she said, yes, when I'm tired, I rest. It's a, a love warning. <laughs> right? So pastor taught about love warning. So I was able to go home and say, honey, it was a love warning. And he's like, turn off the light. <laughs> he had to think about that for a while. So, so the Lord maketh him lie down for three days, and today's day three, and that's why I'm here. So keep pastor in your prayers that he listens to God's love warnings. Amen. I love you, honey. I think he's listening. Praise God. Okay, Ephesians 5.27. That he might present her, his bride, to himself, a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So today we're going to, what are those spots? Blemishes. They're compromise. Amen? So 1 Timothy 6.14. I'll try not to keep you here for too long. I've been known to get carried away. The longest teaching we have in our library was me. It took two CDs. <laughs> but I learned my lesson. Okay. <laughs> First Timothy six fourteen. You're welcome to read with me. That you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. So we're to keep his commandment without compromise. Right? And the Bible says that his word's right near to us and it's not burdensome. So if it is burdensome, there's some stuff we need to get rid of, right? God's got a plan. And um, he, you know, when you first come to the Lord or you try to talk to people about the Lord, sometimes they think that you can't go to church until you don't smoke anymore. Or you can't go to church until you and your girlfriend don't live together anymore. Or you, you know, but Jesus, I want you guys to remember this because it's a good thing to tell people. Jesus didn't clean the fish before he caught them. Amen. Think about that. First, you've got to catch a fish before they can get cleaned, right? So we are the fish, after all. Now we're fishers of men. So come on, everybody, come with all your garbage and let the Lord clean it. And we're going to shed compromise. Let's go to Numbers 32. We're going to tell you a story. I don't think I would want to stand for an hour back here. Sitting is good. Okay. Numbers 32. And when we get to the hard names, I'm not saying all the names, okay? We're just going to skip right over that. Now, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad which were two of the 12 tribes, okay? 
two tribes out of 12. He had a very great and multitude of livestock. And when they saw that the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, okay, so these are all the names of the leaders of the congregation. Go to verse 4. The country of the, the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now, they, now why will you discourage the hearts of the children of Israel from going over to the land which the Lord has given them? So when I was reading this, there must, the Lord must have said, when you go over the Jordan, when you go over the Jordan, when you go over the Jordan. Why? Because that's the place of promise. That's what God gave them as their promised land. But they had to fight to get there. They had to clean out all the giants, even to get across the Jordan. And then you got all this water there. How are you going to get across the Jordan with all these livestock? You need something supernatural to happen. So in this story, we can see a whole lot of things. First of all, God had blessed them already. They had a whole bunch of livestock. That's a sign of riches. So these two tribes with the livestock, they're like, we'll just stay right here. We don't want to go do the work to get to God's promise. So they were just willing to settle, right? So we got to ask ourselves, are we just willing to settle? They were comfortable and they were complacent. Not to mention, they didn't trust the king. They didn't even have faith to go over and find the fulfillment of their promises. And they were lazy. They didn't want to fight. Amen? So they didn't trust the king to get to the other side of the Jordan or the other side of compromise. What's on the other side of compromise? What's on the other side of the American church waking up and letting go and doing things the way God prescribed. Oh boy, revival. I don't know about you, but that's what I'm waiting for. I've been worshiping God like this for 20 years, knowing revival is going to break out in this sanctuary one day. So if you don't want to worship God, stay out, please. I've been waiting 20 years. We want unity. I, I don't want to be. I don't want to wait anymore. So don't drag people to church that don't want to be here. Please. Amen? Amen. We need revival. We need to wake up this country. You think if blind eyes were being opened and amputated legs were growing out, that some people would come to church? Amen. Hello? We need power. Amen. Praise God. So they were unwilling to fight, and then... God said, why would you discourage everybody else? Right? So they had gone, they, they were in disunity, and then that was all bringing discouragement. So, and they also feared what was on the other side. So what's on the other side of your Jordan? Some people have fear of failure. Some people have fear of success. Some people want to stay right where they are because they know, don't know what's going to happen down the road. So just be complacent where you are. God's got a good plan for you. Don't be afraid to go over to the other side. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So we Americans and, you know, we're good people. So if we do the works and get most of it right, then God's okay with the rest that we don't get right, right? So if we obey 90% of the time, then God should just compromise with the other 10%. He knows my heart. But he wants you in victory, right? He wants all of our heart so that we can have that power to be free and affect the lives of other people. Amen? So that little 10% that we think is okay, that's compromise. 
So what are the areas in our lives that we compromise with? He wants us to walk in the fulfillment of his promises and do greater works. So he wants us to apply the word to our life so that we can be cleansed and sanctified, set apart, so that we don't look like everybody else. America is a nation of compromise. So that's the natural. Um, it's like you, you want to be like everybody else. We're supposed to be supernatural. We're supposed to stand out in a crowd. Amen? Amen? So God says we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He says to be holy as God is holy. Well, in America, that's going to look kind of strange. Don't be afraid to stand out. Don't be afraid to lift your hands. Be the one to shine. Amen? You're safe here. So let's go to Job 11. Job 11, 13 through 20. Read it with me. Everybody there? If, if, <laughs> say if, if, yes. If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hand towards him, towards God. If iniquity were in your hand and you put it far away and, it would, not let, and would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, then surely you could li lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and not fear because you would not forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed away, and your life would be brighter than the noonday. Though you were in darkness, you would be like the morning, and you would be secure because there is hope. Yes, you would dig, a, you would dig around you and take your rest in safety. So that's just what God's telling you what we get on the other side when we let go of the compromise. Amen? Let's go to Galatians 6, 8 which we go to a lot, important scripture. Okay. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So we hear that a lot, but what's it really mean so that we can apply it just to our everyday life, right? That's what, that's what the Bible's for. So to sow to the flesh is compromise, is it not? Listen, we all have our struggles, amen? I did not have to eat the whole pack of black licorice that Katie gave me yesterday. But I did. We all have areas that God is dealing with us in, right? So to sow to the Spirit, what does that mean? Part of it's worship and praise. Part of it's staying in the Word. But it's a price. To sow to the Spirit is the price. It's a price to get to the other side of the Jordan. It's a price to get to the promises. It's sowing in the Spirit. Amen? So sowing in the Spirit is Actively exercising your spirit. Everybody say actively exercising. Okay, so you can picture that. You, we actively exercise our physical bodies, hopefully. Um, if you don't, you're going to find out what happens in the end when you don't. I don't want to do that. Um, so, but the Bible says that exercise profits little going to keep you healthy and pain-free and able to stand upright without a walker. Thank you very much. I'm not doing it. Um, so that's what exercise in the natural is, but we have to exercise our spirit in order to walk in the spirit. Our spirit has to be the strongest of the three, body, soul, spirit. Amen? Because your soul is a hot mess. Your mind, your will, your emotions, so your spirit has to be strong enough to tell your soul to shut up. To tell your arms, yes, you will. 
right? So we have to feed our spirit. Actively exercising. So I said before, compromise is kind of like being normal. Our kids all want to be normal. They want to fit in. Well, in America, abortion is normal. In America, homosexuality is normal. I asked somebody the other day, do you believe that God has a spouse for you? And the person said to me, I believe it's our choice. Okay. See how that works out for you. I know a whole lot of people that married the person of their choice. A whole lot. We do a lot of counseling for the people that are married, the people of their choice. Amen? Amen. So do you want to marry the person of your choice, oh, American? Or do you want God to send you the person that it's not going to be such a struggle with? Amen? Amen. So you could do it the normal America way, or you could do it God's way, your choice. So wearing revealing clothes or clothes that are so tight it leaves nothing to the imagination is normal in America. Looking at hot women is normal in America. But God says that to lust after a woman, to look at her, you're already committing adultery. That's the kingdom standard. So if you're doing that, then you're committing adultery in the eyes of God. But if you're wearing the clothes that cause the men to do that, then there are bloods on your hands, right? So these are the things that are normal in America, but God's trying to clean up his church and get rid of compromise. Amen? Amen. So we don't want to be normal. We don't want to be natural. We want to be supernatural. Everybody say, supernatural. supernatural. Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 119. Because we can be. I don't want to settle for less when I can have more. more. Okay, so now we know we got some problems. Let's see what we can do about it. Hallelujah. So let's read together. Psalm 119, and we're going all the way to verse 16. Let me tell you something, you guys. Psalm 119 is all about the Word and what the Word can do for you. We're very blessed to have a very strong word preached by pastor all the time. And we teach you guys to teach and get in the word. But once you don't have to teach anymore, what do you do? Just come and listen to pastor? We really need to be in the word for ourselves. That's where God speaks to you individually about your own compromises. Amen? So let's, let's read this together. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed. When I look into all your commandments, I will praise you with uprightness of heart. I will learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. So what he's saying is if I don't keep your statutes, things aren't going to go very well. Amen? Amen? Let's keep reading. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all your judgments with, of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself with your statutes and not forget your word. So this is the psalmist crying out to God, Ask him for help, because you guys, we can't do this on our own. We can't walk according to the Spirit on our own. 
because that's just being self-willed and doing it our way again. God wants us to be dependent on him. So, you know, the first thing we have to do is to recognize what are our areas of struggle. Don't let it be the 10% of the things that you push under the rug because God, we do 90%, God, surely we can compromise here. No, we're, li we're living in a monarchy. God doesn't compromise. Amen? So, um, compromise has consequences. Amen? So we don't want to gloss over our faults. Uh, in verse 5 it says, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. That's telling God, we need help to keep your statutes. You've got to direct me. So we have to cry out to God. First we have to know what our problem is so we can cry out to God and ask for some help. Amen? So, you know, there's just some things that we don't have dominion over saying things we shouldn't say, letting our tongues go where they ought not go, or our thumbs go where they ought not go. Hello? Texting is saying. You can just think of texting as an extension of your tongue. Don't, don't think that you get away with saying things, you know, just because it's in a text. Praise God. So if you don't have control over your texting, you just got to tell people how you feel then that's one of your compromises you need to work on, right? Um, holding people in judgment. That's huge. That's something I learned kept me bound up hugely. So holding people in judgment, um, that's, I, I was going to go to it, but I, I don't want to take the time. Um, the parable where the servant was forgiven by the master, he was forgiven a debt. And it was a huge debt. So the master, God, forgave a huge debt. How much has God forgiven you? And then he went free from the huge debt, and he would not forgive somebody of a little debt and held him in judgment. So here we are freed up by God, but we're looking at other people judging their behavior. Well, they're supposed to be a Christian. You know, well, you're holding them in judgment. Okay, you can hold, judge their fruit, but that, that's holding them in judgment. Do, does seeing their fruit take you to a critical attitude? That's judgment. And that will keep the church bound up big time. And Christians don't even know when they're holding people in judgment. Well, I'm just judging their fruit. I had somebody tell me not too long ago that it was righteous anger. You ain't sounding too righteous to me right now. When you're just plain mad and letting your mouth run and cursing everybody out, that's got nothing to do with righteousness. Amen? So we just have some issues we need to work on. <clears throat> Gossip is another one. Big time. Let's look at that. Gossip. 1 Timothy 5.13. The Bible says that um, the righteous thing to do is cover a matter, not to talk to everybody about everything. Amen? Amen. First Timothy 5.13. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not. Ooh, uh-oh. Can anybody relate to that? So in order to get free of these compromises so that we can have the fullness of God and walk in the supernatural and be led by the Spirit and have peace, you can't buy peace, can you? I, I'm, this is how you get it. I live in peace. I thank God I live in peace. But it's been a process, amen? So you have to cry out to God, and then you have to be patient with the process. 
Because the devil is going to try to beat you up all along the way. Okay? That whole thing of learning who told you that. If you don't know this word for yourself, you can't compare and see who told you that. I'm going to give you a, a story that really taught me who told you that. So um, at one point, because I was holding judgment, actually, um, my house was being used as the office. And we had five employees in our home working full time. And I had a brand new baby. I couldn't even get in my kitchen to make it without people passing through every which way. And you know, that house is the Lord's. We didn't have an office at the time. And um, I got resentful, and I was holding my husband in judgment. It got me some bound up. And I didn't know what the heck was wrong with me, but I was miserable. So I found out about deliverance, and I went to get deliverance. This is where I learned about judgment. But we learned to pray for other people through the deliverance process. And I prayed for one lady, and um, the Lord told me about she, she was deaf. She wore hearing aids. And she had made herself very secluded from everybody else in her fam family. She played a lot of video games and stuff because she couldn't hear people well. So she just got isolated. And so I prayed for her about the spirit of isolation and the spirit of amusement and commanded them to leave. And her ears opened up. The woman could hear. So this is what I heard. Good job, Katie. How dare you think that? Well, I always recognize a good job, Katie. That's pride. I know not this not for my glory. You did it, God. You know, I just prayed. So I recognize that voice. But right on top of it, right following up, Good job, Katie. How dare you think that? Pride, condemnation. Right? And that's how the devil works. So he'll, he'll tempt you and cause you to sin. Go spend your diaper money on dope, and then he'll beat you up for it. Right? So one devil on top of the other devil. And you've got to really learn to d discern these things. Because as we're growing and getting rid of our compromises, we don't want to be beat up by the devil amen so it's a process it takes a while to learn all this stuff you guys but there is a place where it just becomes natural that's the good news it becomes normal you know god talks about a sacrifice of praise it's not a sacrifice to me at all it's a it's a, a honor and a privilege right i'm the one getting something out of it that's how i feel about it right but the Bible says to give a sacrifice of praise. Well, so go ahead and sacrifice until it becomes an honor. Amen? So be patient with yourself. But if you want the freedom other people have, do what they do. Okay? Um, then another thing we have to do is practice God's presence. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Are you learning something? Well, thanks for letting me be here because I learned something too. Thank you, honey, for causing me. <laughs> he might cause you guys someday too, so don't be surprised. First Thessalonians 5. 16 to 18. Here's a good prescription right here. Prescriptions for our problems. Amen? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Okay. I want the will of God. That sounds like freedom to me. But it says pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? I got to go to work 40, weeks, 40 hours a week. I can't pray all day. Oh, yes, you can. It's, praying doesn't mean being on your hands and knees in a dark room. It means practicing God's presence, acknowledging him in all you do. 
Because otherwise, you're serving the money in your hours instead of serving God. And we're supposed to do everything as under the Lord. But it takes practice. Everybody say practice. Okay, so what have we talked about so far? We've got to recognize. We've got to cry out to the Lord and ask for help. Why does he tell us to ask for wisdom? Because he wants us to ask. He could just give it to us. No, he wants us to ask. He wants us to be dependent on him. So you've got to ask. And then be patient with the process. And practice God's presence. The Holy Spirit can speak to you while you're working your 40-hour job if you're serving God in your job and not serving money. Amen? So where we put our time and energy and resources, that's what we're serving. Write that down. While I get a drink. So I heard somebody say that when we get to heaven, Facebook is going to stand as a witness against us where our time, energy, and resources lie. Hello. I'm guilty of being a news junkie because Guy and I are watchmen by assignment. And we know not to listen to the lamestream fake news. I spend quite a bit of time searching out what's going on. Did you guys know that President Trump just fired the Inspector General of the Justice Department? I'm not going to hear too much about that. Woohoo! He's draining the swamp. So I know these things, but I can't allow all those things to take precedence. So uh, everyone in this room has one of those. Amen? That little telephone's dangerous. Amen? It's, it's way too smart. Amen? So we know about coming to fellowship. We know about worship, or we're learning about worship. So if you're not free to do this yet, ask why. Is it pride? Is it fear? Why aren't you free to worship? Right? So find, you know what the Bible says about the little foxes that spoil the whole vineyard or the little leaven that spoils everything? Those are what the compromises are. Amen? Amen. So the, the thing that we need the most so that we can judge where we stand is the Word of God. Let's go to Hebrews. We're almost done. I think it'll fit on one CD. Compromise to promise. I hear pages. Sorry. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Well, that says it all right there. So it's going to help you to separate your soul from your spirit, right? Your mind, will, and emotions from the part of us that needs to be stronger. And it's going to help you to discern if your thoughts line up with God's prescription. Amen? So we need to stay in the Word for ourselves. Um, and let's go to Psalm, back to Psalm 119. We're going to see some more of what the, the Word gets us. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. I think it's the longest book. I'm not quite sure about that one. But I highly recommend it. Read over and over and over again. Like the Proverbs. The Proverbs will help you get rid of your compromises. And Psalm 119 will really help you get rid of your compromises. Amen? 
So Psalm 119, and we all have them, guys. Don't let the devil beat you up. Just be open to growing. Don't close yourself off to God. You're going to stay that way. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start in 25. My soul clings to the dust. Read it with me. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts so that I shall meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying. Grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O oh Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me your understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimony, and do not, not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me according to your way. Establish your word to your servant, who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Do you hear those words that I'm stretch, stressing? The things he, the, he, the psalmist is asking, teach me, give me, make me, incline me, turn me away, establish your word. Those are things we're asking God to do for us because we can't do it, you guys. We can't do it. But if we live like Americans who just think we can do whatever we want because we're free to do it, we're never going to get there, and we're never going to have the power that it takes to change the world. My husband just heard a prophecy, and we're not talking about dates, but, you know, the, the thought was, or the prophecy, uh, it was a dream by a man named Tom Horn. He dreamt about a meteor hitting the earth, and it was in 2009. That's not very far away. We got a long way to go before we want to be checked out of here. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be here when the meteor hits. I don't want to be here. So I don't want to miss rapture. I, I'm not God. I don't know how much compromise I get to have before I miss rapture. You know what I mean? All right? I don't know. So we want to get rid of that stuff. And not just that. The reason we know what we know is so that we can help other people once we're fixed up. If we don't get, what, how can we give what we don't have? How can you help people get off this planet if you can't get off? Amen? So, um, the other thing, let's go to Hebrews 9, 14, because the other thing I want to mention is the blood of Jesus. Oh, thank God for the blood of Jesus. He died shed his blood, that the veil could be torn, that we can get into the Holy of Holies, that we can be changed, that we can be forgiven of our sin because he paid the price. Don't forget about the blood. We need it. Amen? So the Bible says that we overcome our compromises by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Don't be afraid to testify. Don't be afraid to stand out. Amen? Hebrews 9.14. Oh, boy. Oh, thir let's start at 13. Read it with me. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling clean the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, without spot to God, cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. If that's not highlighted in your Bible, highlight it. How much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through eternal spirit, being led by the spirit, offered himself without compromise to God, how much more will that cleanse us from dead works, from our compromise, to serve the living God the way he prescribes? Amen? And we're going to close at 1 Peter 1-2. We'll start at 1-1. One, one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims. Are you a pilgrim? Amen. To the pilgrims of True Ministries, elect according to the foreknowledge. God elected you guys. You didn't choose him. He chose you. So in America, we think we get to choose. What if God didn't choose you? Amen. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied in Jesus' name. Don't forget the blood of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the... Holy Ghost whoopings that are free. Father, thank you for cleansing us with your word. Cleanse us by your blood. Sanctify us, Lord. Shake us. Wake us up. Help us to believe our King in all that he says. That we are predestined for the supernatural, Lord God. That greater things will He we do than he did. So that we can reach out into this crazy country, Father. That we can show people what it's like to be different, what it's like to be righteous instead of self-righteous. In the name of Jesus, help us to surrender to your will, Father, and live according to your prescribed word. Give us a hunger and thirst to get into your word for ourselves on a daily basis. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God, that it's an honor to obey you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So you can prepare your hearts for communion.